My name is Darren Ware, and I'm very pleased to be here with you this afternoon to talk a little bit about smart cities, country digitization, and the case of Curacao. I think, first of all, what we wanted to do was look back a little bit at smart cities, where we've come from, where we're going, and perhaps what the future is. In smart cities, we've been talking about cities here at Emerge for three years. We've seen in 2010 the first time that the global population reached 50% urbanized at a worldwide level. And if we go back even further than that, we've seen in the 2000s where Amsterdam was one of the first most interesting smart cities to really create a integrated approach with dozens of initiatives across a city to establish Amsterdam as a leading global smart city, um, providing an example across the world. Now, I think if we also look at the reason we talk so much about smart cities, the reason Richard flew 497,000 miles last year, that's not an exaggeration, uh, is because of the opportunity in smart cities. Cities are where the action is, cities are where we all live, right? That's where we live, work, uh, play, learn. That's where things happen, that's where you live in transport, go to your school, go to your job every day. That's where things happen. Um, what's always been the case, whether a Seminole trading post, a fort, a port, or an airport, the infrastructure of a city is key to the economic activity and to its competitiveness, right? So that infrastructure has always been critical. Today, more and more, it's the digital infrastructure that's important. And that's what we're going to explore a little bit today. I think the, um, if we look back again at the beginning of some of the smart cities initiatives, if you ask Barcelona, another global smart city example, if you ask them, they might tell you that in 1992, as they were preparing for the Olympics, that that was the first time that they really took a fully integrated approach to improving operations, improving the service quality, and working together across the Catalan city. Right? And I'm going to emphasize that several times, the importance of really collaborating across agencies, concessions, and the different politicians um, in, a, in a particular city. Right? It's key, in my opinion. Uh, the, the smart city is going to continue to evolve, we think, as obviously technology and solutions evolve. We have the emergence of additional technologies such as Internet of Things, cloud-based technologies, enabling things to happen differently or enabling them to happen in different places. The status of the market today, I think, in terms of what's been working and what hasn't worked is something else I wanted to, to talk about. The, what has worked, I think, is an integrated approach. I've seen so many cities that have an integrated approach where they involve citizens, the public sector officials, and the service providers, whether they're the, the basic services agencies or the uh, concessions themselves, having an integrated approach provides opportunity to find synergies across projects and across the city. You can eliminate redundancies by really finding out what's happening. I can't tell you how many times I've been at an at initial workshop with a city and they tell me, yes, we have a data center project the guy beside him says, we have a data center project, we have a data center project, we have a fiber project, and everybody, just by getting them together for the first time, or the first time in a long time, realizes how much in common they have across the different departments of a city, and how much opportunity there will be for reducing redundancy in their approach to technology usage in service delivery across a city. That part is simply smart practices smart collaboration. The technology is important, trust me, it puts the food on my table, but it also is very important to understand the smart practices and opportunities that you have just for collaboration, which doesn't cost anything. What hasn't worked, I think, there are, there are some cases of what hasn't worked. Um, for example, outsourcing has been a, a buzzword in this, in this area for a long time, and I think one of the things that didn't work, I've seen cities that have outsourced a little too far right, so far that they lose connection to that 411 center, for example. They outsourced it to someone and then they don't have a feedback loop that brings it back to continued understanding of what the citizen wants. 
Outsourcing is good for some reasons, but you have to still maintain a connection to what you've outsourced. Um, I think the politics are often a challenge. You don't always have across a city a unified party across the city agencies, the service providers, the stakeholders, the, um, the concessionaires, and all of those are not always a single party. So sometimes politics does get involved, especially when they're trying to manage the technology. Um, one of the other things that I think is important today is we have seen so many times isolated smart city projects where a city wanted to do something five or ten years ago and they created a specific project, a specific block or a, just a specific app, for example, and didn't always create that within the existing operations of what the city was trying to do. When you don't put it within the existing operations, then it becomes a bit of a, an outlier and is functioning on its own. Today, I think we're seeing so much more the digitization of operations, where it's happening within the, the transportation, the education, the, the water management, all of those things. I think that's happening much more today. We saw that last year on stage with the US uh, Digital Services Agency, which was here from the White House, to talk about how they were in federal agencies helping them. They weren't off by themselves working on something grandiose and specific by themselves. They were within the, um, the federal agencies themselves to try and do that. So, just give me one second. In terms of what has worked and all of that, I think what's going to continue to happen is with the Internet of Things, we're going to see so much more sensor-driven coverage of the systems and the operations out there in the street. That's going to help smart cities continue to develop. It's also going to enable countries to continue to digitize. Um, country digitization to me is, is very similar to the smart cities trend and initiatives and, and the, uh, the marketplace. In smart cities, Internet of Things will be able to do more and more as sensors evolve, as we get the ruggedized sensors into the actual street, into the actual um, trainways and places where before we had no ability to capture data about how the system was working, how the network was working. As we think about countries, country digitization is going to be very similar, where countries are going to be able to modernize, use technology, and see how they can improve their services, their relationship with the citizens, all of this through technology. I'll give you a couple of examples, and then we'll talk about Curacao. There's two examples, Mexico Conectado, which is a Mexican yeah. federal um, connectivity initiative, which is going to connect 250,000 different public sites across the country. It's important to me for two reasons. One is because it's a federal initiative looking at the cities eventually, right? They started with connecting the, connect the, the 250,000 places across the country. The next phase is going to be to put in the state capitals, in these 32 important cities, a specific building for connectivity, for access, for training. So not only are they providing a connectivity platform with Wi-Fi and it's cloud-based and it's very well managed and maintained, they're also reaching out to the cities. So the federal government is reaching into the city to try and help technology adoption. The next one is Costa Rica. Costa Rica in February, I believe, announced its Costa Rica Digital initiative looking at how they modernize education, the government itself and government um, services, as well as cybersecurity. So they're, can, they're again, doing a, a multi-initiative program to see how they continue to modernize the country and make Costa Rica uh, an attractive place also for, for businesses to, to come. Now, <clears throat> I would like to turn to Curacao at this point and ask, um, for example, the, the minister, one thing I, I learned actually, minister, is that your father worked in <laughs> the refinery in technology in Curacao. And not only that, but he met your mother at that job. So truly, it's technology in Curacao that has brought you here today, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in my genes. I right. don't pretend to know uh, too much about it, but uh, I'm certainly passionate about it. And uh, thank you, Darren, uh, for the introduction and uh, for the inspiration and also your friendship uh, with the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, some of you may know, uh, we are here and we have a Holland Pavilion, a big red, um, orange pavilion in the corner. Uh, we are here with uh, also the Ministry uh, of uh, 
foreign economic uh, relations from Holland and 27 uh, or so entrepreneurs from Holland and uh, Curacao uh, here at the eMERGE conference. Um, we share a lot of the uh, ambitions of South Florida, innovation, technology, um, healthcare and uh, life sciences, uh, and also uh, connectivity and, and, and smart city uh, development ambition. Um, Curacao is a small island in the Caribbean, but has always played a large role uh, in terms of uh, international trade going back in the 1700s. Uh, after that, uh, with Shell establishing in Curacao, uh, one of the largest uh, refineries uh, in the region where my parents met. Uh, and my father was managing uh, IT for many years. Uh, and after that, uh, Curacao also pioneered the international financial uh, services, what became known as the offshore uh, industry. Uh, but it's still uh, one of the leading uh, industries on the island. Uh, where we uh, provide value-added uh, services and substance, so uh, no Curacao papers uh, leaking anywhere. Uh, but coming back to, to government, uh, it has been, let's say, Curacao uh, since, uh, let's say, the late 90s with all the drive of uh, improvements uh, related to the Y2K uh, bug or fever. Uh, a lot of implementations and modernizations were done internally but for many years, it was mainly uh, kept, let's say, to a limited scope of uh, departments and, and um, say, government employees communicating via internet. Uh, recently, and I think driven by changing demands outside uh, government as well, you know, a more tech-savvy uh, constituents, uh, companies uh, that demanding, uh, let's say, services to be delivered real time. Um, had spurred a new development in government. Uh, to name a few examples, uh, right now we have a centralized, uh, and, and these may sound, I mean, in our concept, it's big. I mean, for, for some of it, this is already a, re a reality for, for many years. Uh, but as you know, uh, changes like this can, can take quite some uh, courageous uh, decisions and certainly uh, support from the civil servants to make them happen. But in the last few years, we've seen um, a centralized uh, service point being introduced uh, where uh, companies and citizens can go and request uh, permits. And my ministry has been honored to be the pilot, the Minister of Economic Development, where, for instance, an entrepreneur can re request an economic permit that goes back uh, to the back office in the ministry. There it's processed electronically and the response goes back, whether it's accepted or denied, goes back. Uh, to the central point of communication and interaction with the, with the entrepreneur in this case. Uh, similarly, we've seen uh, the tax office has been uh, developing a lot of systems internally, but finally we have a uh, tax portal where citizens and companies can um, submit their tax returns, but also pay uh, via e-banking and otherwise uh, their self-assessment uh, based on their tax returns. And last week, we opened the so-called uh, e-gates at the airport, where you can swipe if you're a resident or an American, Canadian, uh, or European uh, citizen uh, passport. You can swipe it, uh, let's say fill in uh, let, uh, your uh, online ID card, swipe and pass through. And this has changed uh, not only the customer experience, but also the experience of the immigration worker. So these are just to show you a few examples, but I offer you, and I offer you, Darren, also uh, Curacao as a testing ground for uh, more developments in, in the scope of the smart city. Because after all, we believe as government of Curacao, and I, I launched, uh, let's say, what I called uh, put the man on the moon ambition last week, where we want to be as Curacao as uh, one of the top 15 best places to live. Uh, according to the uh, OECD uh, Better Life Index. That's an ambition because we feel that at the end of the day, technological advancement, economic development has to benefit the people, has to benefit life. So in that context, I think Curso offered a testing ground for new technology, innovation, to fuel entrepreneurship, to fuel new uh, government services and interaction, but very uh, two very... Um, Big, I think, opportunities uh, sector-wise is healthcare, life sciences, 
where I think there we have been uh, lagging, but there's, you know, if you have a small scope of community and, and users, you can introduce technology quickly and reap uh, quick results. So I think the return on investment, certainly in, in healthcare, entrepreneurship, but also lifelong learning, offering access, you know, uh, for small children, but also uh, some older children like us, uh, to continue learning in a, in a, in a global platform. Uh, and even uh, like uh, uh, General uh, Secretary Colin Powell was mentioning this morning, uh, transforming the democratic process uh, using uh, technology. These are some of the opportunities that we see on Curacao and uh, we gladly offer uh, Cisco that has been working with us uh, through uh, Curacao Information and Technology Institute, uh, Innovation and Technology Institute to bring about these changes to, to use uh, Curacao as a testing and maybe even a playing ground. Right, exactly. Well, the, the one word I heard you use, which I think was most interesting actually, is not citizen. You didn't say citizen, you actually said customer, which is not the word that many governments actually use, right? Thinking of the citizens that are, that are in fact your customers of the government services, I think is a great initial way to think about that because that's, you have to provide services that are of value, it's your responsibility, but it's also, if you take the perspective of treating them as customers, then they'll want to come back, they'll want to, to engage, uh, and that's absolutely a, a great approach, I think. So, If I may ask you, Darren, and, and, and I'm sure you've worked with governments before and, and the change process, uh, certainly this kind of investment uh, using taxpayer money uh, can be uh, large decisions for government to make, uh, and contrary, to uh, businesses where it's more easier to calculate the return on investment for government, at the end you're, you're serving a social purpose, even though you're trying to deliver better service to your, your customers and in some cases uh, for pay. Um, how did you engage with government to bring about these kind of changes? Right, a lot of times what we do, we do plenty of workshops and I think one thing I mentioned before is starting with an integrated approach whether I'm talking to a country or a city, I always think of three different areas of technology adoption. The first one is the back office, which is the internal administration, you know, the, the, the typical downtown public administration building where you know you need networks and phones and everything in there. But then the relationship from there with the citizen is in the second area, which are the citizen services. So that's the information exchange, um, paying for taxes, for permits, for um, things like that. It's, a, it's, it's like the e-portal or the e-government piece of, of business. And then the third area, which is the largest and, and perhaps most dynamic right now, um, is the basic services, where you're talking about um, transportation, waste management, smart parking, smart lighting, smart waste management, smart anything that happens in the street. It's those infrastructure services, the airport, for example. That's a classic example. But what we always try to do is to see how technology is being used in those three areas. Where is there redundancy? Because there always is. Often those are three different um, fiefdoms or three different rulers across the three. Um, but they may have technology that they could use and share across the three. They may also have assets that they could use. For example, the, the, the classic case in London is of using the, the subway underground to put fiber in, right? Use the fiber in the metro or in the, or, or the, the bus stops. Use the bus stops to make a, a better relationship with the citizens with these, uh, the digital kiosk and the information provided at the bus stop. That can be all tied back to um, overall management of the bus system as well as connecting to the citizen right there at that point, right? So that, that's one of the things that I think is also not just something we do, but something I see cities really do um, as a, as a great approach to try and get everything and under, uh, get everything on the table first to understand exactly where we are and then understand where we are trying to go and identify the opportunities for example one i can mention um, talking about uh, quality of life we have to deal as, as certainly small island development states uh, such as curacao with a high cost of uh, living and and doing business uh, related to for example utilities and, uh, of course, we have been doing a lot of work and, and moving towards renewable energy. I can say that Curaçao uh, is even uh, one of the highest in, in, in uh, the kingdom of the Netherlands in using 
uh, wind power, wind power, and other uh, alternative sources of energy. And we have an ambitious program to move to um, even 30, 40 percent by 2020. Um, but in, in, in identifying opportunities, one of the things that uh, the utility company is doing, because we have, uh, let's say, an older infrastructure for distribution and a lot of leakage uh, in terms of, for example, water and electricity distribution. So mm -hmm. they're putting in place uh, smart technology, smart meters to have a better control of the distribution network right. to save money for the company and, and in the end benefiting uh, the, the, the customer. Um, another thing I, I wish you can, I can invite you to speak some to some of the taxi drivers and uh, <laughs> bus drivers I'm dealing with in Curacao. Uh, I'm still fascinated. I'm, I mean, I, I use for the first time uh, Uber-like or uh, this one uh, uh, service uh, two days ago, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that you can use your and get quality service just by a press of a button. Right. So the world is changing. And uh, I think we have, as Curacao, the ambition to be connected to this kind of change, also from an entrepreneurial uh, point of view. Um, Darren, maybe you can, because you know the region a little bit, we see opportunities for Curacao by connecting our entrepreneurial community with uh, Miami, what we're seeing today, the eMERGE uh, conference, but also other entrepreneurial communities right. in the world. Is this something that you have been right. seeing, mm -hmm. let's say, from the ground up, arising around the world? Absolutely. It's the job creation, the innovation, the connection to universities and the students is always something that we also involve in our conversations with, um, with so many cities and countries. There's, um, there's no end to, I think, the, the, the possibilities out there once we talk about Internet of Things, the new applications, and um, sharing the databases from the city or to, as to what's happening. Um, I think there's absolutely tons of opportunity, and I think you being here today on stage, sharing some examples with everyone that's here to see exactly that is exactly what, um, what needs to be done, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's going to help your, your case for Curacao, right? So we have been asked to, to keep moving at this point, so I would like everyone to join me in thanking the minister for his time, for his examples, and in the Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much.